Understanding the Embryo Transfer, What You Need to Know. Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm board certified OBGYN and fertility doctor. And today I'm gonna to talk about the embryo transfer. So if you wanna learn more about your body and your fertility, please consider subscribing to this channel that helps spread my message of fertility education and empowerment and understanding your body to more people. The embryo transfer is the part of the IVF process where you're taking an embryo and putting it back into your body. There are different protocols for how you do a transfer and there are fresh transfers and there are frozen transfers. So in this video, we're gonna review the differences and what I want you to know when it comes to your own embryo transfer or if a friend is having a transfer or supporting it. So the first is the difference in a fresh and a frozen embryo transfer. So in general, in IVF, if we take an overview of what IVF is, IVF is in vitro fertilization. In IVF, we're taking one month's group of eggs, we're getting them all to grow. That group, remember, was either going to ovulate or die. So we're not tapping into your future eggs or your future fertility, but we're taking hormone shots to get all those eggs to grow. We're then gonna undergo a procedure to take those eggs out of the body, and then in the IVF lab, we're gonna be able to fertilize eggs and sperm together and grow out embryos. Those embryos can be frozen, they can be transferred, or they can be biopsied for genetic testing and then frozen. And so when we think about an embryo transfer, a fresh embryo transfer means that that embryo or those embryos were never frozen. So five days after the egg retrieval, if the egg retrieval is considered day of ovulation, so consider that day zero, five days after this, so day one, two, three, four, five, you would look under the microscope, take a good looking embryo, and then perform the transfer. When you do the transfer in a fresh cycle, what would happen is that you put the embryo, it gets warmed up, it gets placed into a small catheter. The speculum gets placed in the vagina. Using ultrasound guidance, that catheter is inserted through the cervix into the uterine cavity and the embryo is deposited close to the top or the fundus of the uterus. Then you are waiting about nine days when you can take a pregnancy test. Now in a fresh transfer, your body is making some natural progesterone because of those corpus luteum, which were from the follicles. However, they were destroyed because we went in with a needle when we did the egg retrieval. And so we usually like to supplement with some progesterone. Risks of a fresh transfer can include something called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome or OHSS. OHSS is when your body had a lot of follicles and it's making a lot of estrogen. And instead of letting all those corpus luteum heal, they get stimulated based on a pregnancy. So when you get pregnant and you have HCG, those corpus luteum continue to make hormones. And then you're not able to ever heal from those really high estrogen levels. It actually causes third spacing, which means the fluid inside your blood vessels can come out of your blood vessels and it can get into your abdomen and your lungs and your blood actually gets dehydrated. So it could be hard for your kidneys. And so this is a serious complication that really does not happen very much anymore because in anybody who's considered a higher responder, they really should not be a candidate for a fresh transfer. And so somebody who has PCOS or who is very young or has a lot of eggs, automatically their doctor should be saying, hey, you're gonna need a frozen embryo transfer because the risk of that fresh transfer does put OHSS on the table. And that's pretty standard of care. If you have PCOS or you are really young and you have a high egg count number, you should be really making sure your doctor has a good plan when it comes to OHSS and ask those questions. We also have studies reporting that in fresh cycles, some of the pregnancy rates may actually be lower in younger patients than in patients who are a little higher. And this might be due to the hormonal effect of having so many eggs and so much estrogen or an early elevated progesterone. Because in nature or in a natural cycle, you don't have estrogen levels of two or three or 4,000 or elevated progesterone earlier in the cycle. And then this may see why we saw lower pregnancy rates in fresh cycles, even in some younger patients, which was always a little interesting. Fresh embryo transfers were the standard of care back before embryo freezing really became a really good technology. And so that was, you know, IVF in the wild, wild west. When embryo freezing wasn't great, we didn't have genetic testing. We also would put multiple embryos inside because we didn't want your embryos to die in the freezer. And that makes a lot of sense. But now that freezing techniques are so good and almost 99% of all embryos survive the freeze thaw, we really have to make sure that we're doing the right thing by transferring a fresh embryo. There have been studies comparing fresh to frozen transfers and have shown that in frozen embryo transfers, the babies have higher live birth weights and it might be able to be due to a placenta. The placenta is able to grow in in a more normal environment. So we have seen a trend towards doing frozen transfers and frozen transfers allow you to do genetic testing of the embryos and get the 
results and then decide, are you ready to transfer? Are you waiting on normal genetics? Do you have enough embryos for your whole family? Should you do another cycle? So we have seen the trend be towards more frozen embryo transfers over fresh. Personally, fresh embryo transfers, I do these for patients who are young with very low ovarian reserve. So they're a candidate for a fresh transfer. Or if we're doing InvoCell, which is a minimal stimulation IVF process in order to save money, where you put eggs and sperm inside a little device and put it in the body. So fresh transfers, I still do them, although very rare personally, because a frozen transfer is safer and achieves the goals for more of my patients. There are certainly doctors who practice differently. Now, when it comes to a frozen transfer, when we're talking about doing the frozen transfer, there's really two main ideas when it comes to transferring the embryo. So you want to understand these differences. One is considered a controlled or a medicated cycle. Now this has been standard of care. So this is what most clinics do because there's most research from it. There are probably some groups of people who benefit from this more, whether it is abnormal periods, irregular periods, endometriosis, PCOS, because you really can control the cycle and you can use medications like birth control pills or Lupron to suppress the cycle and that may decrease some inflammation or some active endometriosis. The idea between a medicated cycle is your, your ovaries are doing nothing. I'm giving you medications for everything. So typically suppressed, not always, but typically suppressed with birth control pills and or Lupron. And then you're going to grow a lining with estrogen. Estrogen can be pills, patches, vaginal, injectable. There's all kinds of ways. Pills are pretty standard because they're cheap and easy, but I've seen and I've even done combinations depending on the patient circumstance. Typically, you're gonna grow a lining for about two weeks with the estrogen, and then you're gonna come in for ultrasound monitoring to make sure the lining looks good enough. And when we talk about good enough, what we're really talking about is thick enough and pretty. So I think every fertility doctor will tell you we'll take a tri-laminar, a pretty organized lining over a very thick, disorganized one every single day. So the architecture of the lining matters much more than the thickness, but we really wanna see both at an appropriate level for implantation. So you come in for ultrasound and it looks good, and then you're going to be starting progesterone. Progesterone in frozen embryo transfers opens and closes the implantation window just like it does in natural cycles. So we know that embryos implant very specifically when it comes to the day of progesterone. So when we do this, what we're doing is starting progesterone and then typically doing the embryo transfer on day six of progesterone exposure. Now, progesterone can be given in different forms. It can also be given orally, vaginally, and injectably, or PIO. Studies have shown that in controlled cycles, at least some PIO gives us the highest success rates. So you will see some clinics do only PIO. You'll see some do a combination of every other or every third day PIO with some vaginal progesterone. You'll see places do all three. Point is, some PIO has been shown to be better than none. That's a controlled or medicated cycle. The other option is a modified natural or a natural cycle. I'm gonna group these together because the premise here is instead of controlling things and getting your ovaries to be quiet and just artificially growing the lining with estrogen, I'm now going to make you ovulate. So I'm going to give you medications, either letrozole or inductible hormones like FSH to get an egg to grow or I'm gonna follow your natural egg if you have very regular ovulatory cycles. So I'm either inducing ovulation, sometimes I'm using FSH to induce super ovulation, especially in patients with history of thin lining or ashermans, and then I'm following your natural ovulation. You don't have a calendar in this cycle, and you often have to come in multiple times. So I'm measuring your follicle, checking your LH and your progesterone, seeing if you're starting to surge or ovulate, bringing you back again, doing the process over and over again. And so we're kind of fine tuning day by day. And once we see your hormone shift or we see you get to a follicle size and a lining architecture that's perfect for implantation, you can use a trigger shot and then start progesterone and time the transfer based off of that. Now, really, if you miss the window and your progesterone already has rise, then you might not be able to do this cycle type. So it's really important to be followed closely. You also are, have a corpus luteum in this cycle, and so you don't need the injectable progesterone. That corpus luteum, just like we know from our progesterone videos, that corpus luteum makes progesterone. And so it does make it at these pulsatile intervals. We like to give just a little progesterone support because we're controlling fertility doctors, but you really don't need levels checked in these modified natural cycles because the body is doing it. That's the whole point you're going to ovulate a follicle, it's gonna make some progesterone. In some people, we do find that their body responds better to their own endogenous estrogen, and they have a better lining than if they take oral estrogen pills. So I will see somebody who doesn't have the best response to a controlled cycle, and sometimes I switch over to a modified natural. 
Downsides to a modified natural are they are more unpredictable and they do require more visits. And sometimes the medications are more expensive. So it is a lot more involved. And sometimes just having a couple ultrasounds, knowing exactly when the transfer is happening is really nice. So depending on your medical history, if you don't ovulate, if you have FHA, you, you can't do a modified natural cycle. It's not really gonna be the best option for you. If you have endometriosis, you might benefit from a controlled cycle and some Lupron suppression. So these are the basic standard types. So there's a traditional controlled cycle, there is a modified natural or a natural cycle where you induce ovulation. There are a few other cycle types that we sometimes consider, mostly a very prolonged suppressive period. And this is typically considered for unexplained infertility, unexplained implantation failure of normal embryos, or even endometriosis. And this is where you're suppressing for months, at least two months before the transfer, and then growing the lining with estrogen. So it's a type of the controlled cycle, but a very prolonged suppression. So it is really important to make sure that you, know, you have a discussion with your fertility doctor, What's the cycle type? Why? What's that going to look like? What's the calendar going to look like? We do not have a head to head study comparing controlled cycle or a natural cycle. If we did and one was clearly better, that would be the one we do all the time. I think it probably is a personal thing, just like so much of IVF care is, is that what's better for one person is not necessarily going to be the same thing that's better for somebody else. So it's really looking at the full picture to try to decide what makes the most sense. And if you're not pregnant after one transfer, your doctor may want to switch cycle types. They may want to do additional testing. So you have fresh transfers and frozen transfers. You have different types of protocols when it comes to frozen transfers. A few last thoughts about the embryo transfer. One is that you really need to think about how many embryos that you're transferring. Standard of care has changed and we really are favoring transferring one embryo at a time. Even with one embryo, there is a much higher chance of identical twinning than we see in nature. And so when we are transferring two or more embryos, we are risking having that high order multiple situation. We also are risking having extra loss of pregnancy. So if you have twins and you start to lose one, I think all of us have seen somebody who ends up losing both babies. And that's a really devastating outcome. So if we keep our focus on trying to get you the highest live birth rate per embryo, transferring one embryo, especially if they are genetically tested or if you're younger than age 37, is going to be the recommendation. I've seen patients have these high numbers of embryos transferred and it makes me nervous. And I've seen some devastating outcomes of pre-viable pregnancy loss. So really, I know everybody wants to get to that family size and you want to catch up because you're behind and I've had infertility and I've been there too. But these embryo transfer numbers are really to try to give you the best total family outcome that you can have. And so really listen to what your doctor is saying and ask questions appropriately. All right, we'll do more on the embryo transfer, talking about what to expect with the procedure and how to prepare yourself the best. But this was just an overall basics of the different things to think about in the different transfer types. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below and we will answer them in a follow-up video. As always, you can learn more on the As A Woman podcast or follow along on Instagram at nataliecrawfordmd.com. Thanks, friends.